In concluding our day in awe, I want us to zoom out a bit. I'm sure Alex will help us zoom out a bit more. Uh, but zoom out a bit and think about awe in a more global sense. How do people experience awe around the world? So today, I'm going to highlight some of the emerging research that identifies what about awe might be universal and what might be modified by culture. And although this work is quite new, I think it has the capacity to offer novel insights and challenge our prevailing theories about this complicated emotion. So as scientists, why exactly do we want to study awe across different cultures? This work is complicated, it's time consuming, it can be often very frustrating, but it has two important benefits that I'd like to outline for you, and two benefits that I think can only come from looking at awe across different cultures. The first has to do with cultural variation. So it's tempting for us as scientists to use the ready and willing pool of undergraduates at our local universities. <laughs> but the danger in doing this is that we may unknowingly be portraying awe in a way that reflects our own cultural biases. So why would we expect, for instance, someone in the United States to experience awe in the exact same way as someone from Brazil or Egypt or even China? By understanding how awe might vary across cultures, we can get a more complete and perhaps more inclusive perception or conception of this really complicated emotion. In addition, the second benefit is that we get a sense of what about awe is universal. Now, um, in studying awe across cultures, we can really see what actually stays the same or what's consistent. And sometimes this is a really important signal that something has deep evolutionary roots in our human history. In addition, as an affective scientist, I'm someone who wants to call awe an emotion. And in order to do that, one criterion is that it be considered universal. It needs to be experienced across a variety of cultures. So if you're like me and you want to sit awe among the pantheon of other emotions, you need to explore this emotion across different cultures. So what I want to do now is talk to you a bit about what's the same of, uh, in awe across cultures and what is actually different due to culture. So um, our first piece of evidence that awe is universally experienced actually comes from language. So we can find many different words for awe. I've shown you a snippet here from Chinese, German, Russian, Hindi, Hebrew. But this is just a small sample of the many languages that incorporate or include a word for awe. In addition, we also have new work coming out of Facebook, thanks to Dacker's collaboration, from 122 different countries. And in this, we find that people use pictorial representations of awe, which I've shown you at the top of the screen, to communicate with their friends, with their family, even with strangers. Now, you'll notice here that there's variation across different countries. Some countries, the ones in red, may be using this pictorial representation of awe more frequently than others, but the point I want to show you here is that it is being used across many different nations. So there's this idea that we have some form of communicating awe, whether it's language, whether it's these cute pictures here, across many different cultures. The second piece of evidence comes from the fact that we have reliable expressions of awe in the face. And you can see a prototypical expression here in this child, which artists have distilled down into this. And even further, many of you have probably seen the new <laughs> whoa button on Facebook. Now, the fact that we have muscles in our face that reliably move together to create an expression of awe is an important thing for humans across different cultures. So we see this reliable expression of raised inner eyebrows, widened eyes, raised head and eyes, and sometimes the open mouth. Now, all can be communicated in the face, but it can also be communicated in the voice. And there's great work, again, coming out of um, the lab here at Berkeley that shows that around the world we can communicate awe reliably through vocalizations. And these are what we call vocal bursts, which Dacker has mentioned a little bit, and I'll give you some more detail. 
these aren't words or phrases. Um, they are just noises that we make with our voice that can communicate our internal states. And recent research um, done across 10 different cultures showed that the emotion of awe is reliably communicated through these vocal bursts. And importantly, researchers went all the way to Bhutan um, in order to test out these theories in a remote culture. And this is really important for people who criticize universality because their main critique is that countries um, like China or Italy, for example, have been influenced by Western media. So they've seen magazines, they've seen movies, and so their ability to communicate or recognize expressions of awe is actually just reflecting their uh, globalized culture influenced by the West. Bhutan, on the other hand, um, where the people in this village that was visited have very little contact with the West, that's, that's harder to argue. So what the researchers did is they showed participants a variety of different scenarios. I have one for you here um, that represents, in this case, awe. So they would say something like, she sees the biggest waterfall in the world for the first time, and she's awed by how enormous and powerful it is. And then what they would do is they would show participants three different vocalizations and ask them to pick which vocalization represents this feeling. So what I'd like to do is do an example with you guys here. I'm gonna present you with three, and what I'd like you to do is when you hear the one you think matches with seeing the biggest waterfall in the world for the very first time, I just want you to raise your hand. Don't be shy, um, it's okay. So I'm gonna play each one. When you hear the one you think is right, just raise your hand. Aww. Whoa. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Glad none of you picked the third one. <laughs> um, so as you guys probably noticed, this second vocalization, this whoa, was really a representation of awe. And if you're curious, the first one was sympathy, not the whoa, but the oh, it's a little bit different. Um, and the last one was pain. So hopefully you didn't confuse that one with awe. So what I can tell you is that from language, from psychologists testing their theories around the world, we have evidence that awe is experienced across different, many different cultures and that its expression exists and is reliable across many different cultures. But what about um, what elicits awe? So again, researchers um, in their adventurous spirit have traveled all the way to Namibia to visit a remote village um, of people called the Himba to get a sense of how do people in this very different culture experience awe? And is it similar and, or is it different from what we experience in the United States? So they interviewed, they did many interviews of the villagers here. And what I'd like to do is just to give you a sense of what this data looks like, I'm gonna play a video from this gentleman here. At first, he's gonna speak in his native language and then it will be translated. But to give you a sense of what he's talking about, his experience that he nominated was seeing an ostrich for the first time. Yeah, he, he said, this is my first time to see it. I never seen it before. Then he looked at the bird, nice color, long leg, similar to the jacket, but the head is long and it's so big like this, as he had been showing. And then slowly, slowly, it started running, as he was showing with the hands, running like this, running like this, running like this. And then he was very happy and smiling as he was doing it. Mm. And then look at the thing, looking at the thing, and uh, then the other, then for himself, he, he think, oh, this is so beautiful. I never seen such a thing like this in my life. And I was not expect, expecting, as I used to hear from people, that this is how it would look like. And even started running in front of the car, even faster than the car, like this. So I hope you saw some similarities, though it might not be an ostrich in your everyday life, to the kinds of awe experiences that you have, the sense of novelty, of something that kind of challenges what you've normally seen um, in your daily life. So stay tuned to this work. Um, this is very new, uh, hot off the presses data from a very remote part of the world. 
So in addition, we also know that there are some elemental aspects of awe that also seem to be relatively universal. And this is, again, thanks to research coming out of Berkeley, we can um, definitively say that certain elements like this idea of a small self, which you've heard throughout the day in many of the different talks, seem to be um, universal across different cultures. In addition, the important outcome of humility, um, of not seeing yourself, again, as the center of the universe, but as a smaller being within a larger span, seems to be universal as well. In addition, this sense of connectedness, and not just to the other people in your community, but to the larger world more generally. And these are three of the first that we've identified, but I'm sure of many different universal elements or outcomes of awe. So I've given you a sense of experiences, expression, elicitors, and outcomes that are universal. So what's left to be modified by culture? What's different? So if you remember, I showed you this um, example of different languages and how they identify awe. But what I didn't show you is how it's actually defined. So if you look up these words that are construed as awe, these are the definitions. Respect and fear in China, fear of high status or nobility in Germany, trembling, fear, respect. As you can see, there are two pretty clear themes that might be surprising for you one being fear or threat, and the other being a sense of status, and especially low status. Now, this counters, uh, as Dacker said, our Californian notions or perhaps our Western notions of what awe actually is. But if you look at Merriam-Webster's dictionary of awe in the English language, this is, in fact, how it's defined. A strong feeling of fear or respect and also wonder. That might be surprising to some of you, and it was certainly surprising to me. But if you look at the origins of the word awe, it actually comes from the words that represent terror and dread. So it has these elements of fear right from the very beginning. And if you look at biblical references of awe in ancient texts, you see that it is used for trembling in front of a punishing or smiting God. So there's this sense that awe is a feeling towards something powerful and perhaps dangerous. And if you think about what the origins of awe might be, and that's something that concerns affective scientists, why do we have these emotions? What do they function to do? It's argued that they are a response to a powerful leader. So in our early hunter and gatherer societies, it might have been a chief. As our societies got bigger, it was leaders who often, which may not surprise you, had these kind of demigod uh, status. And even today, we see it for modern leaders like Obama. So if you think about awe in this sense, then it starts to actually become a question of why is awe not this way in the Western culture? What's different? What happened? Why do we have this more positive construal of awe? And is that really the way it is around the world? So it's with this that uh, we went to China and did some cross-cultural research comparing students in Beijing to those in the United States. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about this work just to give you a sense of one potential of many ways in which culture may be shaping the experience of awe. So in the first study, we had participants do what we call a daily diary. This is very simple. At the end of every day, we had them write about an awe experience and how they were feeling their emotions during the day. And we had them do this for 14 days in both China and the US. And what was interesting is that in China, we found that many of these instances that people reported feeling awe were very social in nature. They were also very hierarchical in nature. So many people listing awe towards a boss as a subordinate. In addition, we found that participants in China reported feeling fear along with their experience of awe. Now, this was in contrast to what we saw from participants in the United States. Many more of their awe experiences were actually alone, and they were in nature. In addition, these experiences were more positive in nature and elicited other positive emotions, but not so much fear. So if that's what you're thinking is the experience that comes to mind for you, that would be in keeping with the culture that we live in here in the West. Now, these experiences were idiosyncratic to the participants. They were allowed to come up with the experiences most meaningful to them, but we wanted to know how they would respond, potentially, to a stimulus or video that was standardized. 
Mm. So we had participants watch a awe video. And this was one we had piloted in both the US and in China to elicit high levels of awe. And it was, not surprisingly to many of you, probably a planet Earth clip. Um, and what we found, again, in this study, replicated our effects from the first study, which was that participants in China who watched the awe video clip reported high levels of fear and surprise in conjunction with awe. That was, again, in contrast to participants in the United States who reported awe in conjunction with high levels of amusement, mirth, and gratitude. So even when we show people the same awe-inspiring situation, they respond differently. Now, these responses are in their reports. So maybe you might explain or expect that, um, you know, in the West, we kind of push our negative affect down. We don't want to experience it. So maybe we just report more positive affect despite feeling more negative. But what we also found were that these differences were, in fact, reflected in physiology. So while participants in the United States showed a decrease in heart rate during the awe video compared to the... Um, there we go. Um, to the neutral video they watched before, participants in China actually showed an increase. This is to the same video clip. And an increase in heart rate may signal fear, anxiety, stress, whereas we think of decreases that they typically uh, are a signal of a calming down of the body or potentially a positive affect. So we can see these changes even within the body. So Western awe may be different in that it's more positive in nature, that it um, elicits gratitude and joy and amusement, but that might not be the case around the world. And that's something that as awe researchers, we should care about because we want to make sure when we talk about awe that we're not just talking about it from a Western cultural perspective. So to finish, um, I would like to also mention that we're continuing to collect scenarios, videos, audio clips from around the world using Project Awe in order, as I said, for this grand um, goal of creating a inclusive <coughs> definition of awe that really reflects the way awe is experienced across many different cultures. So with that, I would like to thank you and also challenge you to always remember what cultural biases you might bring to your awe experience. Thank you.